Um, and I'll try to answer your questions, uh, or say, say the questions that you ask um, so that people watching can hear what you're saying. Um, but yeah, hey everybody. Sorry, let me just, there we go. Now I can see you. <laughs> um, so my name is Kent, and uh, I'm a software engineer for PayPal. Here, let me get, I don't have any slides really, but um, I can give you this slide. Um, this is my typical um, intro slide, so ignore the title of the, uh, the talk, so just intro stuff. Uh, so I'm local here in Utah. I graduated from BYU. Um, I went through the MISM. Um, I graduated four and a half years ago. Years ago, um, I, I work for PayPal right now. I uh, work from home in Pleasant Grove. They don't have an office. Like they have have an office in like Draper, I think. But I've been there three times um, to pick up my laptop to fix something that I broke on my laptop, and then because I forgot my password, uh, <laughs> I actually I changed my password and mistyped it twice. Um, so that was fun. Um, yeah. So this is a bunch of stuff about me. Um, I forgot to update the slide link here, but anyway, you can ask me about some of this stuff later. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today, though, is not uh, specifically about React. I'm going to be talking about uh, GitHub and open source. Um, and yeah, before I get too far into, like, lots of what I'm going to be showing you is how to do stuff um, with contributing to open source. But before I get into that, I thought it'd be useful to explain why I think open source is such a useful um, thing for you to participate in. Um, so, uh, but before I even get into that, I think it'd be great to get to um, a good understanding of where you all are at as far as open source and specifically GitHub as well. So, is there anybody in the room who has contributed to an open source project already? Okay, we got a couple of you. How many of you um, have, um, have a GitHub account? Okay, and so um, has everybody like pushed code to GitHub, to a GitHub project. Is that something that you're all doing in school like now, like everybody's putting their projects on GitHub? Wow, that's so great. They didn't do that four years ago. Um, it would have been nice. Uh, but yeah, like we all kind of did that on our own um, eventually. But yeah, it wasn't the, the way we did things. So great. That, uh, that saves us quite a bit of time. Um, so. Yeah, let's talk about open source, why it's so cool. Um, so I did, um, when, I, when I was in school, um, I, I remember we had some Java projects. You're all doing C Sharp or something, right? You're not doing Java? No, you're doing Python, right? OK. First half of the core is C Sharp and then Python. And then Python, OK. C Sharp and Python. But you're not doing any Java? No. That was an introduction class for a while, but they're shifting to switch to C-sharp. And then they're going to switch to JavaScript. Switching to JavaScript? Yeah. Yes! <laughs> That's right. Just jump over all those things right. and get right to the language that matter. No, just kidding. They all matter. <laughs> they're all great. But uh, Let's be honest. You're biased. You're on the TC39. I, I am so biased. Um, it's very true. Um, but JavaScript is true to me really, really well. So. Um, despite the lack of types, um, but we can add those. So um, yeah, so um, when I was in school, we were doing Java. And um, I remember making a library, uh, like a little library that I would just copy and paste the files to all of my projects. And I called it my helper library. Uh, and then I finally realized that I could put that on GitHub. So um, uh, Java helper, I think, is what I called it. Maybe Java dash helper. Yep, there it is. Here's my very first ever open source project. This is my novel about um, for documentation for the library because I didn't know Markdown. Um, but yeah, you had your I/O helper, your email helper, your string helper, a swing helper. <laughs> man, oh man, this is so cool. Reflection helper. Now I I really got into uh, Java reflection. I I remember there was one project that we had where um, um, I generated all of my class, all the code for my classes based off of XML because we had to like do a ton of um, duplication for our DAO objects and all this weird stuff. I learned a lot. It was cool. But I realized that, hey, I can take all this stuff and open source it, including my um, IDE settings. Um, whoops. And um, 
And now I can use this anywhere in any of my projects. I just, um, you know, I, I don't even remember how I installed this thing um, into my projects, but I was able to just reuse it all over the place. And it was cool. I didn't open source it with the idea that, oh, hey, like, let's um, um, let everybody else in the world use my stuff. It was just mostly let me more easily use my stuff and, and, and keep track of changes. I had 125 commits. What the jump? I don't even know what I was doing on this thing. So, um, yeah, so I had a, like, I worked a lot on this. Um, and the desire wasn't necessarily to open it to the world. Um, in fact, this technically is not open source because there's no license. Um, and so it's, it's public software, not open source software. So it wasn't too long after that I, I wound up getting a job. Uh, wow, this is seven years ago? That's weird. Um, wow. I'm like, sorry, a lot of nostalgia going on right now. Um, so it was a couple years later that I got into JavaScript. I saw the light, and um, and I decided I wanted to start doing some more open source things. Um, actually, here I'm gonna I'm gonna revert. We'll, we'll get back to that. There was one other thing that um, was really impactful in my path toward open source. So I ha I even have a short URL for this pull request because it was first PR. Uh, no, maybe I don't remember that short URL. First PR. Now, I can't remember what it was, but your first PR. Let me, let me find my first ever pull request that I made. Wait. Hey, that was me. Huh, that's fun. Um, there is first, yeah, first PR.me. This is how you can find your first ever pull request. And mine was to um, the Play Framework, which we were um, using at. Uh, Domo, where I was interning at the time, and I remember I was diving in the Play Frameworks code to figure out how some APIs were working, um, and I noticed that they had a spelling error in their um, in their Java doc. So I was like, "Oh, okay, I'll I'll see if I can figure that out." Uh, and I uh, made a pull request uh, to their Java. Doc. I cloned the repo. I made a change in locally, and then I. Uh, I forked it, cloned it, and made a change, and pushed it, and opened this pull request that cha literally changed this, and inadvertently changed the line endings too. But um, they didn't they didn't bother me about that. Um, and then they just had me sign their CLA, basically saying that the code that I wrote doesn't belong to anybody but them, uh, because if you do this on your uh, company time, then sometimes there can be some problems there. So um, they make sure that you sign a contributor license agreement. So I did that, and then they merged it. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been, they, they gave me pie later um, for having done this. This was my first ever pull request, my first experience contributing to open source. Luckily for me, my first pull request was actually merged uh, because it was so simple. Lots of people, it's not quite that, uh, doesn't work out that way. Um, but it, it was just really cool to think that um, code that I had touched and contributed to was now um, being used at companies like Domo or like all these other companies all over the world that are using this. Um, and I've, I've since contributed to uh, React and Angular each. Um, I never contributed to Ember, never got really into that. Um, but like just those two projects, now code that I've written is actually shipped to like, you, you probably have a browser tab open right now with code that I've written. Um, which is like super cool. Like that's a really awesome, um, awesome thing to think of. Like, wouldn't it be cool if you wrote some code and and now like we're all running that code on our computers? I just think that's a really awesome part of open source. Um, so it wasn't it wasn't for a while until I created my like an actual open source project that I wanted to um, wanted people to use, um, and it's Genie JS. Um, and this was when I finally discovered JavaScript, and and I, I searched on Google to find this lamp for my uh, uh, for my project. But basically, if you've heard of Alfred, it's like hello, um, where you can search for anything on your computer. Spotlight's the same thing. Windows got has has the same thing. I wanted Alfred for the web, and so that's why I built Genie, um, and that's what that's all about. So you can uh, say, oh look, there's a Chrome extension, and there's you know report an issue, and and you can execute those things, and it, they can do different things. So I built Genie for the web, and um, that was that was pretty cool. I never like I don't think people are actually downloading this thing. 
Um, now I'm curious. Um, npmtrends.com slash genie.js is the module name. Um, white screen. Okay, genie.js. Oh, no dot. There we go. Wow. People are literally downloading this thing. Um, it was a, my first ever open source project. The reason that I, I bring this up, though, is <clears throat> I took that code that I wrote uh, years and years ago, and um, there were pieces of that that were um, really useful, and I created a, more recently, created a new open source project called Match Sorter, which is being used by quite a lot of people, 221,000 downloads a month. Um, and so, like, this experience of of having things out in the open, not only does it make things uh, easier to maintain and, and to uh, like share among for yourself, but it also like can potentially help a lot of people solve a lot of different problems. And you can take pieces of the things that you've built and make other things out of the, um, those pieces. Um, so open source is a really awesome thing to be a part of. It's a lot of fun to um, uh, to contribute. You learn a ton in that experience uh, in like making pull requests and, and having people review your code. It's like getting free coaching, free mentoring because you're contributing to somebody else's project. Yeah? You may talk about this later, but you don't have to market your, your open source stuff. And you have a thousand stars on it. Did you have to get people to download that at first or did it just happen? Yeah, good question. So the question is, did I, do I market my open source stuff did it like how do I, how do I get a thousand stars on one of my projects? I, I didn't realize that this had broken a thousand. Actually, that's fun. Um, so, yeah, I am a very enthusiastic person, and if you follow me on Twitter, you're gonna see that I self promote like nonstop. I'm always promoting the stuff that I'm making, um, and I, I have no shame um, because I I wouldn't yeah I, I wouldn't promote it if I didn't think it was useful. Um, so yeah, I definitely. Uh, self-promote and now um, I have a pretty significant Twitter following so things that I, I promote tend to get attention um, so yeah definitely there's a lot of promotion in, involved with that um, early on I had like a hundred Twitter followers I tweet it and like two people would click on the link and and yeah I got stars from that um, and uh, well, but like the the real um, where, where the real promotion happens is in having like rock solid documentation and um, and just a really nice API solving a real problem um, that people are having. And then uh, it kind of naturally, often it will naturally grow from that. Unfortunately, if you don't have like much of a following, you can shout it at the top of the rooftops when nobody can hear you. Um, and so, yeah, it does take a little bit, like let's solve this problem really well and then uh, maybe find somebody who does have a nice following who could benefit from the solution. Uh, and then they can um, kind of magnify your, um, your efforts there. But uh, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. OK, cool. So um, yeah, talking about open source and, and things is really fun. Um, it, like I said, it makes you a uh, better developer because um, you're getting feedback on your code for free, basically. You, um, uh, you go and help, you help somebody else with their open source project. And they're going to thank you by reviewing your code. Now, not, not everybody who's going to review your code is like, um, necessarily a brilliant developer. But often they, uh, they are, and they can give you some really valuable insights. Um, and then in addition to that, just the, the thought that your code is running on uh, people's servers or um, in people's browsers all over the world, um, that's, that's a pretty exciting thing. Um, and, and hopefully, your open source contributions are help, uh, helping make the world a better place. Um, unfortunately, you can't really choose how people use your open source software, so I'm sure that my my stuff is um, doing bad things too. But um, hopefully, m mostly it's doing good things. Um, cool. Any other questions before we talk about how we um, do this? I'm I'm basically going to walk through contributing to a, an open source project for the rest of the time. Um, but does anybody have questions before we do that? Okay. Sweet. So you can follow along if you want to. You already said that you all have a GitHub um, account and that you're familiar with uh, committing to GitHub. So I'm not going to go too far into like setting up an account or whatever. Um, so 
yeah, this is the project that we're going to be contributing to. It's Egghead.io, uh, GitHub. This is actually, what I'm going to be showing you is based off of oops, a course that I have on Egghead.io. I built, uh, or I created um, like almost three years ago, um, how to contribute to an open source project on GitHub. So if you want to dive in deeper, then uh, you just Google that. And I, I just watched it today uh, to review, and it was kind of fun. Um, actually, fun fact, so this lesson, how to rebase a git pull request branch, um, or no, I think it was how to squash, maybe it was both. I was holding my uh, son while I was recording. You don't see my face on it, um, but I was holding my son while I was recording this because he was awake and I wanted to get these done. Um, so I, d I don't think he, he made any noise, but uh, listen carefully. Um, but yeah, so you can watch this later if you want to get a little bit deeper dive. Uh, but this is the project that we contribute to. Um, at the end of that course, I invite people to practice on this project, and I invite you to do that as well if you want to practice uh, contributing on an open source project where um, you will be like kind of shepherded into uh, contributing, then you're welcome to do that here. Um, what's really cool about that is this project has got um, has 80 code committers. So 80 people, and most of these people, this was their first ever pull request that they ever made um, was to this project. So that's pretty cool. Uh, lots, actually, some of these people I recognize from other parts of GitHub that they contributed to this, and then they started contributing to other projects that I have, um, which is kind of cool. Yeah, fun. The, that's one of the things about open source is that um, a, a lot of open source, you, you think it's all about the code. Like there's millions and billions of lines of code on GitHub that people are contributing to all the time and stuff. But most of the time you spend on open source is uh, revolves around um, dealing with people. In the issues or in the uh, pull requests, um, you spend a lot of time talking to people, trying to figure out the, a nice API for uh, some function you're, that you're writing, or um, trying to convince the maintainer that your contribution uh, should be accepted, um, and then trying to explain to you a, an entire world of context that you know nothing about. Um, to explain why it, it does or doesn't work that way. Um, so uh, that's another thing you get out of open source is, is working with people and being empathetic. And uh, yeah, it's cool. Um, OK, cool. So this project is actually published on NPM. You can install it, Stack Overflow, copy, paste. Uh, and it has a whole bunch of um, functions that people have written where they basically find a Stack Overflow answer and copy and paste that um, minimal modifications into this project. Um, so we've got like text justification and two power validate email, sum, subtraction, subtract. We've got both of those. I really don't care what gets added. It doesn't matter. <laughs> um, so long as it's not like a virus or something. Um, so yeah, we've got tons and tons of stuff. And then in addition to that, we also have all the tests for each one of these as well. So um, let's think of a um, contribution that we want to make to this project. So we want to we add some um, feature to, our, um, uh, to the Stack Overflow copy-paste. Uh, hey there. Yeah. <laughs> it's good to see you. Um, so what is a utility function that you search Stack Overflow for on occasion? Is there Anyone, anything come to mind? How about like getting the, I, I just searched for this and I don't think it's in here, the last item out of an array? Well, that would be nice. Okay, so um, this is what we do. We're going to go to the issues here and we'll say, hey, I want to make a new issue. And this is really a really important step. Actually, even before this, um, a good idea uh, before you even start contributing at all is go to the contributing MD file and read through this. Not every project has one of these, but many do. And they'll explain, OK, so if you want a new feature, if you want a bug fix, if you want um, you know, whatever, if you need support, um, these are the things that you do. So most projects, that amounts to filing an issue. But some projects have a, a different place where they're tracking issues or, or whatever. Some projects even turn off issues and expect you to make a pull request first. Um, and so you'll want to um, read the contributing guidelines if they're available. If they're not available, then that's a perfect contributing opportunity 
to add a contributing MD file to the project so that the maintainers can um, um, can explain what they expect out of uh, contributions. Okay, so but generally we're going to open an issue and we'll say uh, I want or yeah, can we add um, a last function? And here we can say yeah, what, like explain whatever you want. Lots of projects here. I'll go to one of my um, one of my projects. Mitchell just reminded me of. Um, so here we'll go to the issue. We'll file a new issue, and we have this template that's already been preloaded for us, um, and we just fill out that template. Some projects um, like Babel um, will have multiple templates. So when you create a new issue, um, you'll have uh, templates that you can choose from. So um, yeah, that's a, like pretty pretty cool um, opportunities there. You can explain or and they'll say, hey, click preview, and then you can see, read what it, they actually want you to do, which is pretty cool. Um, but in this case, we don't have anything like that. So we can say, I want to add a last function that I can use like this. And then we'll add a, a JavaScript comment block. We can say, um, my uh, array, is that big enough? I didn't check before, sorry. Yeah, OK. Um, so we do one, two, three. And then const last equals um, or last item equals last array, and then that would be three, right? That's what I want. Cool. Okay, so we submit the issue, and then the maintainer will get an email, and I can't show you that because I created the issue, so it's not going to send me the email. But a maintainer will get an email, and um, and hopefully uh, they'll respond. Um, so I, I didn't mention this, but I have over 100 um, open source projects that I manage and maintain. Um, and so I get a lot of emails. Like, I get a silly number of emails. Like, crazy number of emails. Um, and so I, uh, and all, all from GitHub. And so I sometimes will not respond right away. Um, and you should recognize that. There are other people who have like 700 plus repositories that they're maintaining. They get, I don't even know how many emails, they probably break servers. Um, so be patient and um, and if, if you really need a, some functionality in a project, there's this little button up here called fork, uh, which you'll use to make your contribution anyway. You can fork it like right now, before we even get an answer, we can fork it, we can make our, um, our functionality, we can publish it to the NPM registry under a different name and we can start using it and benefiting from it today while we're waiting for the maintainer to, um, to actually respond to our issue, if you really need it today. Uh, and, and there are other ways that you can, um, um, that you can um, use, your, uh, use this project with uh, your own code, too. So um, yeah, be patient is all I want to say. Um, but hopefully they come around and they say, yeah, sounds great. Am I talking to myself? Um, so, yeah, they, they can come around. They say, yeah, sounds great, awesome. Um, oh, and then what stack overflow answer will you use? And so now we're like, oh, OK, let's go do what the maintainer said. We'll go to stack overflow. And we'll search for get last index or last item of an array in JavaScript. This is typically not what you're going to do when you're contributing to open source projects, but um, yeah. Remove, no, we don't want to remove it. We just want to get the last item in the array in node. Um, it'll work in both. Um, there we go. Cool, there it is. All right, yeah, we can use this one. Oh, we could use Lodash. No, we're not going to use Lodash. Um, but I'll share this link and I'll say, this one. Oh, <laughs> whoops. Now we'll edit this. Edit. OK, sweet. And we can say, great, do it. OK, so this is, the, um, this is how we're, we're going to implement our stuff. So let's go ahead and make this happen. Uh, you'll typically go to the contributing guidelines again, and there will be instructions on how you get the repository set up. Um, and here we even have ex what contributions are acceptable. These are the things that it needs to have. 
every project is going to be different. This file will look different for every project, so you want to read it and, and follow, uh, follow the instructions. Um, I've got these instructions memorized, so I'm just going to uh, do it myself. Um, I also, let's uh, get rid of that. You didn't see that. Uh, I, I did run through it just to make sure that everything still works, because this is JavaScript after all. Um, OK, so typically you're going to fork this. Um, and actually, I have forked it already. It's right here. Uh, so um, now I'm going to click on clone or download. Um, and you'll clone. Uh, typically, you'll, you'll probably want to do this with SSH, and you want to have that all set up. You're, you all have your GitHub set up. Um, for anybody who doesn't, you can look at the um, my course on Egghead, and it'll tell you how to get that all set up and how to debug it when it inevitably goes wrong. Um, but yeah, so we'll just copy that and we'll say git, let me pop that up a little bit, git clone that, and it'll clone it. And then we can cd into stack overflow copy paste. And now let's follow the next step in our contributing guidelines here. So we forked it, cloned it. Um, we haven't created a branch yet, so let's do that. We're going to make a new branch. Um, I, I have a bunch of git aliases, and so I don't, can't remember how to use git without my aliases. Branch, I think that's what you say. Um, and I'll say pr last. No, nope, I, <laughs> I don't know how to. Check out, oh, check out, thank you. See, the way I do it is git b pr last. But. There it is, yeah, that's right. No. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, I see, I see, okay. So I created the branch, but I didn't, didn't check out. Okay, that makes sense. All right. <laughs> uh, okay, so now we're on our branch. Let's see what next. Run npm install. So actually, on all of my projects, my uh, projects today, I have a single script called setup. And so now you just say npm run setup, it'll run everything for you. Um, install and, and the tests and the build and whatever else to verify that you are all set up. Uh, and this is actually a really critical thing. So if you don't hear anything, else, or if you only hear a couple things, this is one of them. Um, before you change any code in the project at all, make sure that the tests and the build work. So here's a story. I wish that I haven't had this experience more than once, but I have learned this lesson a couple times. Um, I cloned the repo, made a bunch of changes, and uh, remembered right before I pushed up, oh, I should let's just run the tests, run the linting, whatever, to make sure that everything's good. So I ran it, and a bunch of stuff's busted. And I'm like, what have I done? I ruined it. And I spent two hours trying to figure out, like debug the tests and things, figure out what I did wrong. And then it occurred to me, oh, I wonder if they were already broken before I even started. And so I cloned it over here, and I ran the tests, and everything was busted. And so I didn't break anything. It was already broken. Um, and so before you do anything else, before you change any code, make sure that, every, that your environment is in a good state. Okay? Maybe it doesn't work on Windows and you have a Windows machine. Or maybe, like, I wish I could say that wasn't ever a problem, but it like, very often is. Um, uh, yeah, like maybe the tests are already broken. Maybe there's, somebody committed a bad, had a bad commit or something. So make sure that it all is working. So we're going to run npm install. Um, NPM, for those of you who are not familiar, is um, the node package manager. Um, wow. I haven't updated dependencies in here for a while, so there, there you go. Um, but uh, <coughs> yeah, so uh, this is installing all of the uh, dependencies for, um, for the project so that we can run all the scripts and the tests and whatever else we need. Um, we've got some vulnerabilities, but we're just going to make that go away. Um, so then the next thing, we want to run the tests. So npm t will run our tests. And npm run build to run the build. So npm t, this is actually short for npm run test or npm test. They just know that we're lazy. We run that all the time. So they made an alias for us. Uh, npm run build. So we'll run both of those. And cool. We're good. Oh, uh, rats. You know what? My master on my fork is like very old, so I need to back up. When you fork it, your master will be up to date. Um, and actually, I skipped a skipped a step. So let me go back here. We're gonna check out the last thing. So master. Um, so one thing, 
th this is actually also important, um, and I, I forgot to mention this. Um, when you fork a uh, project, you are literally making your own version of that project. So GitHub does not keep things in sync for you. You are now on a totally different track, okay? And so as um, the or originating or the upstream repository can have more commits and people can make changes to that, your repository will not keep up. Um, you can make sure that it keeps up by doing what I'm going to show you to do here in a little bit. So um, right now if I go git remote, I can see I have one remote. It's called origin. That remote refers to uh, this repository right here, specifically the repository at this URL. Okay. So if I want to um, have my project keep track uh, or stay in sync with the upstream project, um, then I need to have a remote that references this URL. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say git remote add, and I'm going to call it upstream. You can call it whatever you want. You can call it my dad. Um, but we'll say upstream, uh, and then we'll paste in that URL. And then I'll say git fetch upstream. So we can get all a whole bunch of the information uh, from um, GitHub about that um, that upstream um, doodad. What's the word I was thinking? The uh, repository. Um, so now here here's the real trick. So now if I say git remote, I have two remotes now that I can reference. But um, by default, I'm all of my branches are going to be keeping uh, my local branches on my machine are going to be keeping track of, uh, on the branches that are up on. Um, my fork, so what is origin. But for master, I want um, master to be um, pointing to the upstream so I can keep master up to date. And then I make a bunch of branches that'll be on my fork. Um, and the reason that we're doing all of this is because um, when you fork a, a project, or the reason that you fork a project is because you don't have contribution access to that project directly. So I, I can't push new branches to that repository. I can't push directly to master. And so we have to have our own copy, and we update that copy. And then here in a little while, we'll um, make a pull request so that uh, they can pull our changes into their repository. Okay, So uh, I think that was a little bit of context that I should have given you earlier. Sorry about that. Um, OK, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, OK, I realize that my local repository branches, everything that I have locally on my machine, is pointing to origin. So when I make updates and whatever, uh, back and forth, it's coming from origin. But for master, I want to be able to pull updates from upstream. So I won't be able to push to upstream, but I can at least pull from upstream um, so that I can keep my local uh, copy of master up to date. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'll say git branch whoops, set upstream to upstream master. And the branch that I want to set the upstream to ma upstream master is master. Okay, so now my local ma um, master, when I say git pull to, to pull the changes, it's no longer going to be coming from origin master, it's going to be coming from upstream master. So I say git pull, and I'm going to get a ton of changes. Now I have a million tests and everything. Um, and uh, yeah, sweet. So now I'm going to actually delete that branch that I made before, um, PR last. And we're going to make a new branch so that it's based off of our uh, master. So we'll go git, what is it, check out the PR uh, last. You don't have to do PR slash last. That's just a convention that I do. You can call it whatever you want. Um, my dad is a favorite. No, just kidding. Um, all right, so now uh, let's go ahead and run install again because we probably installed uh, data dependencies. So install, well, we definitely did, and we probably will again. Um, but there, there could be new dependencies that were added since uh, we last, um, or, or since the old version of master that we had before. Um, and got to keep this handy so I don't forget how to get the last item out of an array in JavaScript. How many of you uh, have actually ran npm install before? OK, cool. So this isn't totally foreign territory for most of you. Uh, yep, 38 vulnerabilities. Hopefully none of them stole my tokens. OK, so now um, we're going to run our test, npm t and npm run build, following the contributor guidelines. Uh, and this time, it's going to 
um, yeah, run a lot more tests. Actually, I think because of my uh, the way my um, background is, you don't really see this, but there's a spinner there. Ooh. Looks more fun when you can actually see it. Um, yeah, the testing framework that I was using when I created this repository, I think it's since been updated and it's like millions of times faster, but I don't want to update it because I'll mess up everybody who watches the course that I recorded like three years ago. So, uh, so it's a little bit slow and we've got uh, a lot of people have contributed, contributed tests, so. Yes, question, Mitchell. Yeah, question is, do I use Yarn instead of NPM? Um, I have used Yarn. I used Yarn for a while when Yarn got the lock file, like when it was just introduced and NPM didn't have a lock file and doing a lot of workshops, I, I need everybody's machines to install exactly the same thing. Um, that consistency is nice. Um, but then NPM uh, got a lock file and I didn't want to have to tell everybody to install yet another package manager after I told them to install Node. And so I just go with NPM because everybody's already got it. Um, so, and NPM is really fast and, and all the, I, I see very little difference between Yarn and NPM, so I don't know. Yeah. Okay, sweet. So we ran the build and um, we compiled a bunch of files and all that stuff. So we're all set. Uh, let's just double check the contributing guidelines here again, make sure we're following along. Um, all right, now we can run the watch command, the test colon watch. npm run test colon watch. That will start Ava in watch mode. Ava is the test runner that, um, that we're using. Um, I wish it was Jest, but uh, it's not. Now we're going to open up our uh, code editor. How many people are using VS Code as your code editor? Wow. That's crazy. Even for like your C sharp and Python and stuff. Wow, that's cool. Um, yeah, I have a love hate relationship with the, with every editor I've ever used. Um, I, I'm never happy with my editor. Um, let me. Uh, but one thing that I love about these JavaScript based editors or these web based editors is that I can um, uh, I can make changes to them so easily. Uh, like this is a, uh, my JSON file for settings and I can just whoop, swap that and now my editor totally changes That's in a way that's good for workshopping and stuff. It's nice. Um, except it probably didn't bump it up enough. But when I was using Atom, it was even more that way because you had like a style sheet that you could edit and like I, I hid stuff and I moved things all around. It was awesome. I love the web. It's so good. So good. Um, okay, so we've got our tests running. Uh, now we can make our tests and make sure that we get s or our our um, our function, whatever. So I'm gonna go to my source. I'll say last.js, and I want my um, my function to um, or, or my file to look very similar to all the other files in the project. So I'm just gonna copy this, put it in here. Um, this is very dependent on like what you're contributing to the project, or whatever. So all all this stuff may not um, translate well to what you're whatever it is you're doing. Uh, but yeah, so we're gonna have a we're gonna call this function last, um, and it's gonna take an array, <coughs> and then we're gonna oh let's make sure we know how to take an array. Oh, well, copy that. Okay. Good thing we have Stack Overflow to tell us how to get the last item out of an array in JavaScript. Okay, so array. Uh, dot length minus one. All right, cool. Uh, and then we're gonna want to change this. This will be an array. Uh, array. The array. <laughs> I love JS doc. <laughs> so crazy. Um, okay, and this is gonna be anything. The last item in the array. Sweet. That documentation is gonna help so many people. Okay, sweet. So we've got our function. Now we're going to add last.test.js. And here we'll go back to the add.test so we can save ourselves a little bit of time. And we'll pull out last from source. Oh, well, we're going to need to go back to source really quick to get the index. Here's source index. I'm, I'm going kind of fast intentionally because it really doesn't matter. Um, like the specifics of this implementation um, to our subject on um, contributing to open source. Um, so yeah, we're going to import last from last. And we'll put it last. Ah. All right, so then we can import last. 
Um, and we'll say gets the last item from an array. Sweet. So then we can say const array equals one, two, three. And we'll say const last item equals last of array. And then we can say the actual last item. And we'll say expected, oops, expected equals three. Sweet. All right, cool. And make sure to, what? Oh, oh wait, no, one test path, there we go. Okay, that was a previous run. Whew. All right, I was like, wait, JavaScript is broken. Finally, this is the day <laughs> that it stops working. Um, cool, all right, so we made our contribution um, locally. All the tests are passing. Let's go ahead and, uh, what I like to do is often open source projects are going to have some sort of continuous integration um, associated with them. So lots of projects are using Travis CI, but you also hear things like Circle CI, and um, I, shoot, I can't even remember. What are the other ones? Um, cycle? I, I don't know. Uh, I, pr I pretty much only use Travis because uh, it works really well. But uh, if you look in the configuration for whatever CI service they're using, you can often find the uh, scripts that they're going to run when uh, they build your project. So I like to run those locally before I even push it and make a fool of myself by breaking the build. Um, just kidding. Uh, but only sort of kidding. So I'm going to run this same script that they're running. Okay, validate script. Okay, yeah, we'll run the validate script. That sounds reasonable. Okay, so that's going to do who knows what. I don't even know, but so long as it doesn't break, then I know that I didn't break anything because I already ran everything that they told me to run uh, before I made any changes. So hopefully nothing breaks. Otherwise, whoever's maintaining this thing is a total jerk. I don't know. Um, Let's just get this all squared away. Maybe I should update the testing framework. That would just be so confusing for people. Anybody have questions while we're waiting for the test to finish? Yes. Yeah, good question. So if, if you have hundreds of projects that you can't possibly maintain, how do you prevent or avoid people being angry at you? Um, so one thing that I've learned as a maintainer of open source projects is uh, to remember that I don't owe anyone anything. Um, and so like, I want this function added to your project. I'm so glad that you want that function added to my project. Um, I will get to it when I'm able. And if I'm not able and you get mad, that's your problem, it's not my problem. Um, and so, yeah, you, you learn to, like, you care, um, but you don't let that, um, I don't know, I, I've just learned to not let it bother me. Um, so there, there are lots of times I'll get an email coming in, because um, lots of uh, lots of the time when somebody files an issue, it's not because they want to contribute to your project, it's because they are they need help using your project, which is fine. Um, and especially when you're trying to build a community around it, you want to really help, uh, and you want to encourage other people to help and stuff. And I've got a whole other uh, talk that I can tell you all about managing open source projects. Um, but uh, and actually, if you're really interested in that, um, you can find it here. Managing an open source project. Um, I think I actually just did another run through of this, and it was recorded. So I need to update my site. But um, if you go to my YouTube channel, you can find um, my playlist. I'm literally live streaming right now. Um, go to talks and workshops, and yeah, here it is. Oh no, wrong one. Uh, oh, maybe I didn't. Uh, snap. Well, you can look at this one, this practice run at the meetup to get an idea of that. Um, but yeah, so you just kind of develop a thick, thick skin and um, um, build a community around your project so you don't have to do a lot. I have lots of projects that I don't actively maintain. Um, and some projects that like I've even on GitHub, I've archived the project so it still is there but people can't file issues. Um, because like I'm not maintaining it, nobody stepped up when I 
uh, ask anybody. Um, and sometimes they'll email you anyway, and you just have to ignore those. Um, they'll find your email and like, hey, there's this project. Um, yeah, so you want to help people, and especially when you're, you're just getting things started, you want to build a community around the project, get people interested um, and stuff. But ultimately, um, family and relationships are where happiness comes from, not open source. And so if you're, this happened to me, if you find yourself um, sacrificing the important things in life for um, these little open source projects that you're trying to maintain and stuff and juggling, uh, actually, Conan uh, Albrecht likes to talk about glass balls. Has he talked about? You have you're juggling some of these balls of rubber, some of them are glass. Just don't let the glass balls fall. Um, and if if you have to drop a rubber ball every now and then, that's fine. Open source is a rubber ball. Um, your your family's not. So um, yeah. So if people are getting mad at you, just pretend they don't exist and um, help them when you can. Okay. Cool. Does that answer your question? Yeah. All right. Sweet. Um, yeah, there were times I would stay up until like two in the morning working on some open source thing. My wife would get kind of upset and that just made nobody happy. Not it, not me, not the people using my stuff. Like, well, I think they may have been happy. Um, <laughs> but, uh, okay, cool. So now if we look at our uh, git status. We've modified one file, that index, so we can export this. And then we added two files. So I'm going to git add um, all the stuff. And now we've got those ready. They're staged for commit. So we're going to commit all the things with the message. Um, I don't know. Um, whatever. I'm, I'm doing this on purpose to show you. Some projects will have um, Git hooks that are installed when you install their dependencies. More and more projects are doing this. Um, when, I, when I created this uh, course in the first place, not many projects really did that. Um, but yeah, a lot more projects have been doing this where um, if you forget to run the tests or the validation, whatever, to validate things are set, then they'll do that for you. Um, or even if you did do that, they're going to still do that for you. Um, and so that's generally a great thing, unless it takes a really long time to run the test. Um, but uh, yeah, so if things break, then the commit won't go through. OK, so you can commit all day long. If you have broken tests or the linting's busted or whatever, the commit's not going to happen, and you can't push any of your changes. You can't even say, hey, like here are the changes that I made, but I don't know what I did wrong um, to the uh, maintainer. And so I'll show you how to get around the commit hook so you can at least push your changes and show them what you've done so they can um, help you solve the problem. Um, but uh, yeah, you'll, you'll probably come across this. And actually, this is going to break um, right here because we have an invalid commit message. So this was actually more common to do um, when I made the course than it is now. Uh, fewer people are validating commit messages. Um, but they, uh, this project has a specific uh, commit message format because this project is actually automatically uh, released. When pull requests get into master, uh, a, a change log is generated and, and the release is made and it determines what type of, uh, like what version uh, bump, like how to, it determines the next version based off the commit message generates a change log off the commit message. And so that's why the commit message is, uh, has a format that you have to follow in this project. Some, Like I said, some projects do that. Some projects even have you run a script to do your commit rather than um, actually run git to do your commit. Um, fewer projects are doing that now, I think. Um, and the reason that my projects don't do this anymore is actually because GitHub, um, recent, in the last year or two, released a feature where I can actually change the commit when I merge. And that like changed my entire life. It's so great. I love it. I'm so happy with that. So I can still automate all my releases. This is the big secret. This is how I can maintain 100 projects. It's because I, I, um, I don't have to release them. I, it's all automated. Um, but yeah, so anyway, we have to follow this. And this is where the con contributing guidelines um, are really, really helpful. Uh, so here we actually do have a script we can run um, to generate our commit message for us. Or we can follow the standard ourselves. Um, so you, you read through the contributing guidelines anytime you come up with a, a problem, or if that um, if your question isn't answered in the contributing guidelines, then you can um, go into the issue and say, "Hey, I, like I don't know what's going on," and, and hopefully they're kind and helpful. Uh, so I'm I'm going to go ahead and we'll commit all the things with the message of uh, feet. That's a feature. Uh, last, that's our subject, and um, add. 
um, last function. And then it'll run all of our stuff again. So I'm going to skip all that. Um, if, your, uh, if the git hooks are failing and you can't commit, this is what you do. I don't recommend doing this regularly. Um, I have uh, commit hooks in my projects at work. And sometimes it can take a little while, so my coworkers will do this a lot, and then our build breaks. And it's really an... Okay, I shouldn't say that. They don't do this a lot, but it does happen sometimes, especially if like weird things are going on and they don't want to take the time to figure out what's going on. It's really, really annoying. But no dash verify. Um, that allows you to commit, and it'll totally skip the commit hooks. Um, and yeah, and then we commit immediately. I'll do that sometimes myself if I don't want to wait for the commit hooks and I feel pretty confident that they would pass anyway. And then I'll yell at myself when like 10 minutes later Travis actually does break and I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot I didn't remove that variable or I don't know. So um, cool, so now we can push. Um, by default, this is going to push to origin and origin is our fork, right? So we need to make a pull request from our fork to, um, uh, to the uh, upstream repository and a really cool feature of github is when you push to a fork or actually I think even a, when you push at all it will show you um, some output on creating a pull request so that's pretty cool so we'll copy that and I'll open that up in my uh, browser here and I can um, open a pull request right uh, just right from that if you don't want to do that or you like lose that or something um, sorry I've got a um, a Chrome extension that's changing the way GitHub looks. So yours won't look like this. Sorry. Which is it? Oh, it's Refined GitHub. Really good one. Refined GitHub. It's really great. This guy, Sindre Soros, he has, I think, probably a thousand packages on NPM. And he's probably one of the most, uh, like, his packages are downloaded probably the most of anybody, almost anybody on NPM. Very, very prolific. He, he earned, like, I think it was like the equivalent of fifteen thousand dollars when he was just he lived in Sweden or something, um, and then he he took that all of his life savings of fifteen thousand dollars and moved to the Philippines or something. He's been living just doing open source full time, not working at all for a couple of years, and then he does like side jobs every now and then just to earn a little bit of money because it's just so cheap to live out there. Maybe it was Taiwan or something. I can't remember, um, but yeah. So he does just open source for fun. Um, or for fun and all day. <laughs> Sounds like a pretty cool life if you don't have a family and stuff. Did you get that pull request on the message because you had a different upstream? Or yeah, yeah. So, um, no, actually. Okay. That'll, that'll happen anytime you make a, or you push a, a branch to GitHub. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm using Refined GitHub. That's why it looks different. This little thing will pop up right here for you. Um, and you can just click on that, and that'll open up the pull request. Or that, that only lasts for like an hour, and then it won't show that anymore. Um, so if that has happened to you, uh, then you can go to the pull request, and you say new pull request. And then you'll click on compare across forks. And you'll change the head fork to your fork. And then you can change the branch to your branch, which is PR last. And then it'll show you the difference between what is in your branch and what is um, on the left side here, so our upstream um, and the master branch. And so then we have our source index was changed and then we added these two files. Looks good to me, so I'm gonna make uh, create a pull request um, and yeah, say let us merge this now. And then often it's a good idea to add a GIF. No, just kidding. You can if you want to though, those are always kind of entertaining. Um, now this is a box you wanna keep checked allow edits from maintainers. This means that um, even though once you've forked your uh, a project, um, that project is now completely yours. It's not kept in sync, like I said before. It is entirely your project. Nobody can contribute to it that you don't give access to. Not even the maintainers of the original project. Um, and that's great. But one really cool, or one um, kind of frustrating thing as a maintainer so when somebody opens a pull request, they add some documentation. There's a little typo in there in the documentation. And so I have to add a comment that says, oh, you missed an E at the end of, or, or like you spelled receive wrong because everybody spells receive wrong. And so now you have to go and, and uh, say, oh, could you update that? And they have to like pull it and they have to do all this stuff, run the hooks again. Oh, it's such a mess. So 
by saying allow edits for maintainers, you're actually um, allowing maintainers to edit or to make changes to that branch on your fork. You're just giving them uh, like a little slice of contrib contribution access. And what that means is they can um, push to that particular branch and make changes on their own. And they can change that like right in the GitHub UI. They don't even have to pull it down or anything. And they don't have to comment on your pull request and say, hey, could you change this little thing? So keep that button checked, because I love that as a maintainer. It's really nice to be able to okay, make that. Does that allow them to make the change when the pull request happens automatically merge into their repository and also affect the changes in your repository? Yeah, yeah. So what happens is anytime you up or anytime there is an update to the branch uh, from which the pull request is being made. So anytime we make an update to PR last, um, our pull request will automatically be updated um, because we're the pull request is from that branch to that branch, not from that branch at that time to that branch. So it's it's a reference um, to whatever that branch is at, at any given time. So um, when the main, when you do this and allow the maintainer to make changes to that branch, um, it uh, th they can make any updates that they want to, and the pull request is auto automatically updated. And then when they merge it. Uh, once that merge happens, then like all bets are off, and you change that branch all you want, and there no pull requests are updated. You can actually make a new pull request of the same branch, um, but yeah. Uh, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Sweet. So now we'll create a pull request, and um, yeah, often you will have CI and like other things that are um, that pop up here as status checks. Let me see if I can find. Um, let's see, let's see, GitHub React Profile, hmm. oh, whoops, GitHub, I don't think that one, React GitHub Profile, there we go. So if I look at a pull request in here, um, this has a couple more status, um, statuses, so you can have like tons of these status checks that these projects have, um, and you can look at details. Um, this this is one of my favorites. This is an automatic deploy of a pull request. That's like you can play around with and stuff. I just think that's the coolest thing. Um, okay, so um, we can actually look at this uh, because this is open source. Um, I can look at their build and see what their build is doing. Um, and it couldn't download the cache. What a shame. Um, but uh, yeah, we can follow along and make sure that our pull request passes. And if it doesn't, then we can uh, look at the output and see what went wrong on CI and try to figure out ourselves uh, what the difference is between our local machine, because we know it works locally, but it doesn't work in CI. That's like the worst situation ever, because debugging basically means um, committing and pushing and waiting for CI to run, or figuring out how to get CI in like a Docker container locally on your machine, which Docker still scares me, so um, I don't do that either. Um, so yeah, generally, uh, maintainers are going to wait for this to get, uh, for CI to pass before um, they make any uh, merges or anything. And so we'll, we'll wait for a little bit. Uh, but I'll show you, um, since I'm also the maintainer on this project, I'll show you a couple of the things that they can do. Um, they can add reviewers. So Sylvester the Tomato is actually the original creator of this repository. My wife, when she was here at BYU, she had a, a tomato that she named Sylvester. So that's why I created that GitHub account. Um, and, uh, and then we, we can also assign people uh, to, um, to look at this. Um, but that's, these are things that only maintainers of the project can do. Um, and maintainers can add labels to it. Um, they can even add it to projects. So you've got like this Kanban board in GitHub, which is pretty cool, and milestones. And some pull requests are really small and, and get merged immediately. It's like a waste of time to do any uh, lots of these things. But other pull requests are like really enormous, and thousands of lines of code have changed. Try to avoid those um, if you can. But uh, yeah, so they're they're going to be long lived. You'll have like lots and lots of comments and and stuff from people um, commenting. But uh, uh, another thing we can look at is the commits. So a uh, pull request is um, saying I want whatever's in this branch to go into this branch, and so uh, you can have many commits in this. Um, in a single branch that uh, is not in the master branch, and so we can, um, uh, so you can have many commits in here. Uh, checks is actually something that I haven't really used, but uh, yeah, there are. I, I haven't looked at this yet. There are like apps you can use, and 
looks interesting, but I haven't done anything with that yet. Um, uh, files change, you can look at the diff here. And what's really cool is you can actually comment and like, LOL, what a funny joke. Get it? It's last. Okay, so then um, this is the review process. You, you add a comment and uh, you kind of batch comments together so you can review and be like, what nice JS docs. Um, and then when you've like reviewed everything, you said, oh, let's change this, let's do that. Um, then you go up here and you can leave a comment. Um, I, I'm the pull request maker, so I can, I can comment on my own pull request uh, and I can say, nice, right? Um, as a maintainer, I can also reject, or, or um, oh, what is, what is the word? Here, let me find a pull request. I can go do that too really quick. Um, yeah, well, so you can, you can close it, but specifically what I am, do I have any pull requests on here? Nope. Um, GitHub, or it's React, GitHub profile. I had a pull request there. Uh, except I opened it, dang it. Um, Um, there's one. Did I open that? Okay, good. So, um, as somebody who did not open this pull request, um, I also have the option to request changes, uh, and that'll put a little red X in there, which looks really mean. So I actually never use that button. <laughs> I, I always will do comment or approve. Um, by approving, there it adds a little check mark. Um, as a maintainer, my check mark will be green. But any random stranger on the internet can come in here and approve a pull request. Their check mark will be gray. And, um, and so you can say, I approve of this thing, but I have no power in, <laughs> in this project. So feel free to do that. Um, it can be useful, but sometimes people just kind of laugh at you for doing that. Um, not normally to your face. Um, so let me think. Yeah, and then you can respond to these comments directly. You can even add a thumbs up. Um, or these reactions, whatever. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much all that I wanted to show on this page. So our build is hopefully almost done. Look at all those tests. I feel so confident that this thing is going to work. Because all those tests. Okay, so it's almost finished. Um, yeah, it's done. Sweet. So now we get a nice green check mark, and we can see these checks. Um, we also have these statuses. This is Code Cove. Uh, making sure that we have 100% code coverage because, goodness gracious, it's a really small project. Uh, it's easy to get 100%. Uh, we can look at those too if you want to. Lots of people are using CodeCov um, or other uh, services. So, yeah, having these checks, pretty common. Oh, <laughs> thanks, Steven. Yeah, so we get that little gray checkbox. Um, <laughs> that was adorable. Um, so we can, we can go ahead and make changes to this as well. So let's go ahead and do that and see what happens. Um, Last.js. Here, we'll do last.test.js because we'll just do that. I don't know, just because we'll uh, commit um, stuff. And I'm going to no verify that because, oh, whoops, add, and then commit that stuff. OK, then we'll push. And now our pull request has two commits, and um, and if we look on here, um, it is very soon. Travis is like, "Oh, there's a new commit here. Let's rebuild this whole thing. Start from the very beginning, get it all going again." And we can look at that. It's an entirely different build. Uh, that was build 292. This is build 293. So that that original build is always going to be there forever. Um, and uh, yeah, job hasn't started. We're not going to wait for it this time. Um, <clears throat> but if we go to files change, it's going to say, hey, this is a subset of re uh, changes, refresh, so I can click on that, and we get our changes, uh, we can see that change, and I can say, hey, I like naming my numbers, I don't know. Um, and then we can look at commits, there are two commits in here. Um, yeah, so I'm not going to wait for that Travis build to finish, I'm Just that'll take too long. So what I'm going to do now is, I'm on the maintainer side of things again, um, I'll squash and merge. So actually, there are a couple options here that maintainers have. Uh, create a merge commit. This is, I, I despise these. Um, it basically takes all of your commits and um, puts them into a single commit and just like, well, it, it takes them and puts them on the master branch in addition to a merge, a special commit called a merge commit. It's really annoying. It makes your GitHub or your Git history look like garbage. So I never do this. 
Um, I will do a squash it and merge, which will take all of the commits from this pull request or from this branch, stick them in a single commit, and I can change what that commit message is. Now the original author still gets um, uh, the like their name and whatever as the author of that commit, but um, at least it's like okay, only this one commit did this one thing uh, rather than having a million commits. Uh, you can also rebase and merge, which will basically um, take the state of master and the state of your PR, and one at a time it'll say, okay, this first commit of that, let's stick it on the front of master, and we'll take this one, and we'll stick it on one at a time, boom, 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 um, in front of master. And so that I'll use that sometimes, but normally I'm just going to do a squash and merge. So I'll click on that. Yeah? That first option, just kind of every single commit that was in that old request ends up looking like a separate commit. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah, but in addition to that, it also makes a special merge commit, um, which is just like garbage. So it's sort of similar to rebase and merge a little bit, but it adds a uh, special merge commit, which is annoying. Um, but my favorite thing is squash and merge because it allows me, before I actually merge it, to change the commit. Uh, and so this is what powers um, me being able to automate my releases and my change logs by, like, at this point in time, I'm, I'm preparing my release as a, a, a maintainer of this project. Um, I would say a vast majority of projects do not automate their releases, um, but a, a great many do. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's a great thing. GitHub actually recently announced beta access to something called GitHub Actions, which will probably make automating releases more common um, as soon as it's like usable by everybody. It's really cool and exciting. So uh, lots of times I'll, I'll make my changes. Um, actually, like 50% of the, um, I, I think at least half of the pull requests that I merge on my projects, I merge them from my phone. I release software from my phone, which I think is the most mind-blowingly awesome thing. Um, but yeah, so here I'm, I'm saying, hey, this is a new feature. Uh, this is the subject of the feature. And this is um, some more description, a summary. Um, and then. I can say, oh, I don't want that to be um, in the commit, so I'll just say thumbs up, because why not? Um, OK, so then I'm going to uncheck wait for successful checks. I think that's actually from refined GitHub. Um, so we'll confirm squash and merge. It's merging. And ta-da, it's been merged. Hooray. Uh, we can delete the branch. I like to do that. Um, for some reason, I feel like it saves bytes, but you can actually restore it, so I don't know what it does. It just like is deleted, false in the database somewhere. <laughs> like, um, so yeah, then we can go to Stack Overflow copy paste. We can look um, at here. Um, I don't know who the 413 downloads a month are, but like, I don't recommend downloading this thing. Um, but yeah, we can look in the source. Or actually, here we'll look at our our commits right here. 108 commits, and that's our commit right there. Ta-da! Yay! Um, and we can actually comment on commits too, which is interesting. Some, sometimes random people will comment on like really old commits, um, just like, why did you do this? I don't know. You weren't around. Tell me not to. <laughs> um, so yeah, then we can look at our source and we can see there's our last.js. And sweet. I just realized there was one thing that I um, messed up, and that is... Um, in the pull request, when you create a new pull request, or um, oh, rats, well, here, let me see if they did this. Nope, they didn't. Um, you can actually reference issues that this pull request is open for. So you can say closes number whatever. And the reason that you do that is so that when that pull request is merged, it'll actually automatically be delete or, or uh, close. Um, so since we didn't do that, we're going to have to close it ourselves. And we'll come down here and say, Done it. And we'll close that ourselves. Um, let's just look at one other thing now. Um, we can look at the Travis build. Lots of projects will have badges like this. There'll be a build, and you can click on that, pop that open. And it's building right now. It's going to take a second. Um, but once it's finished, then um, that release will go out. We'll be on NPM version 1.77. That's when that's all done. So, uh, OK. So that's that. Um, kind of a whirlwind tour of contributing to open source. But hopefully, like, you got some insights out of that. Um, 
let me just wrap up by saying open source has legitimately changed my life in really positive ways. Um, I've met some of my dearest friends through open source. Many of them I haven't actually met in real life. And whenever I go to conferences, I'm like, oh, snap, you made that pull request. Um, it, it's just a really awesome experience to see these people in, in real life. Um, and uh, yeah, just like these really amazing people who are incredibly skilled at what they do can review my code, um, I can review their code, we can get better together and uh, together deliver some really awesome software to the world that other people can use and ship in their products um, and hopefully make the world a better place. So uh, if you haven't really gotten into open source before, I strongly encourage it. Um, there are like dark corners to open source just like there are dark corners to everything. Most of it has to do with entitlement and people being kind of mean. Um, but for the vast majority of open source is really positive and a really awesome place to be. Um, so I encourage you to get into it. And that is, yeah, that's all I have for you. Uh, yeah, we, we can, sorry, that was the awkward like, oh, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, does anybody have questions about open source in general? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. So when do you, we, we do this on free time? Um, so early on, mo lots of it was free time. Um, but uh, lots of companies are really open to uh, you contributing to open source because uh, most companies are using open source. And so if you've got a bug in your application, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I don't care where the code lives where that bug is. If that bug is in my source code from my work project, then I'm going to fix it there. If that bug is in the source code for a project I'm using, then I'm going to fix it there. And that will probably be an open source project. So from my perspective, I don't really care where the code is, that where the bug lives, or where the feature is needed. I'm going to write the code for that. Now, you definitely want to check with your employer, because um, some employers are really mean and don't like you to contribute to open source, in which case I say, the market is too hot for you to work at an employer that doesn't let you contribute to open source, unless you're Apple. I don't know. They don't like. I will never work at Apple so long as I can't contribute to open source. Sorry. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, as, as for me now, today, most of my open source contributions actually happen during the day uh, when I'm working. Um, so we can actually prove that, I think. Wait, what? That's cool. Rocking it at BYU. That's what I'm doing. I should add him. Oh, they do the Octocat if you don't add an emoji. That's cool. OK, um, so let's see. I think there's a way you can find like a punch card or something. Um, I think it's on a per repository. Oh, it is on a per. We'll look at React Testing Library. I've been doing a lot with that. Well, OK, I'm not. There's a way you can look at a punch card. And if I showed you, it'd be mostly during the day, mostly while I'm at work, because we're using this project to work. Um, and lots of uh, uh, PayPal people are using React Testing Library. So um, yeah, that's generally kind of how it works for me, is I, if I'm using it at work um, and, and we have something we need to fix, then I'm going to just do that during work hours. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, there was a long time, especially early on, and, and even now, um, that I just really enjoy working on open source. And so I'll just do it whenever it's convenient um, or whenever I want to and my kids aren't screaming at me. I don't know. Um, so yeah, good question. Yeah. Um, so when you're developing something in-house, say for your company, what's the conversation like to take that and you say that's it's good enough to put open source? Like, What's your experience with that in terms of like, ways to get that to happen? Yeah, so um, some companies I worked at uh, we're very like open and, and free about their stuff. They're like, yeah, I don't care where you put this code or whatever, how you get your job done. Um, so there, lots of, of my open source projects are um, from a, a time where I worked at a company like that, um, where I kind of default to open source. Like if it's, if it's a reusable module, in fact, I've got to talk about this, um, about how to open, oops, source your stuff where I explain like, how the, the process that you go through needs to be generic enough to be useful 
um, but not too generic enough, or not too generic to be like worthless. Um, yeah, it actually solves a, a problem that other people will have. Um, so yeah, as long as it factors into those things, I kind of think open source first. Yeah. Um, but like at lots of companies, the process to get code to be open source is a little tricky. And right. so um, like at PayPal, for example, it's not really hard, but uh, it takes a little bit of work. And so I'll, uh, we have GitHub Enterprise at PayPal. I'll make a separate repo for it and treat it like an open source project. And then when it's ready, I'll, I'll go and open source it. Um, and that was the case with PayPal Glamorous and PayPal Downshift, um, where I, um, I I saw these as like perfect candidates for an open source project. And so I um, treated it like an open source project. And then when it was ready and released and, and things were good, then I, I went through the process to get it open sourced. Um, so yeah, kind of depends on the company. Any other questions? Yeah. My favorite project I've created. Um, so right now I'm pretty into React testing library. Um, I think it's pretty pretty dope. Um, there's also it's based on DOM testing library, which is pretty cool. So if if React isn't your jam, um, I don't know why, but if it isn't. <laughs> then you can use DOM testing library with any framework. Um, so I, I, I'm pretty pretty happy with those. I think I hit the nail on the head with that. Um, Babel plugin macros, if you're like really into some pretty insane things you can do with JavaScript, um, this is downloaded 4 million times a month. But that's actually because it's a dependency of create React app or React scripts. And so I'm just riding on those coattails. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it, um, but like, and actually, it's going to be added in Gatsby soon. I think it may already be like it's, it's a pretty sweet project. Uh, I oh yeah, I some of my projects have this little support button that's been clicked not many times like ever. Um, <laughs> I think some people may have because I'll get random donations for ten bucks every now and then. But um, let's see, Crossy and V uh, used to be my most downloaded package. Uh, I think it's a oh wow, it's four million as well. Um, this one, I feel pretty cool about this because it enabled lots of open source projects to be usable on Windows, where um, lots of um, lots of open source projects, especially in JavaScript, lots of people are on either Linux or Mac, and so that, that's all they care about, um, making sure it works. Um, and it, it was hard to make some of the, some things work um, on Windows, but this made it really easy, and so um, I'm pretty happy with that uh, that one as well. I don't know. Um, yeah. One interesting thing about this um, contribu contribution graph. Let's let's go back to when I was in school. Uh, I graduated in 2014. Um, and you can see, look at, at this right here. So I most of my time was spent in commits and issues, and then in 2015, um, that kind of changed more, fewer issues, more pull requests, still a lot of commits. And in 2016, started doing a little bit more code review, and um, and then I exploded in code review. So that was 2017 was the year that I went from uh, contributor to maintainer. Um, I think I mean I, I maintained plenty of projects in these years, but um, now I'm pretty much like I'm reviewing people's code most of the time, which is kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, still spending a, a lot of time um, working in open source. It's just like thinking about this um, open source thing, it's changed my life in so many good ways. Uh, it's so much easier to um, to find work when people can see your work, and um, and when they use your work at, at their job, like they're oh yeah we already have we we already shipped your code to production like like I can go into an interview and they say well, why, why should we have you here shipping code to production? I could say, you literally are already shipping my code to production. Um, that's kind of cool to be able to say that. Um, so anyway, I'm just like blabbering on about um, how cool it is to be involved in open source, but it really is. Um, yeah, any other questions or anything? Yeah. So I don't know if you covered this earlier, but is there a reason you use GitHub over GitLab right now? Yeah, why GitHub over GitLab or anything else? Um, mostly because GitHub is where most everybody's at. Um, and uh, so it's just easier to, to be where everybody is already. Um, 
But yeah, GitLab, I hear really cool things about GitLab, like their GitLab CI and stuff. Like it's all integrated and it's super nice and stuff. But um, yeah, most everybody's at GitHub, so I just stay where everybody's at. And it's also like a really sweet product too. So. Okay, cool. Thanks everybody. Significant others, roommates, children, dogs. <laughs>